Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're here today to see the exhibition and hear the dialogue about the exhibition, He, which is all very exciting to us here at the museum. I'm Joe Rosa, the director of the museum, and it's thrilling to have everybody here. Our collectors, our curatorial colleague, friends, scholars, guests, here at the museum on this beautiful day. Um, before I get into remarks, I just want to first and foremost thank Alan and Kurt for lending their collection to the museum, just this small portion of a brilliant collection, but also really for being friends of the museum and wonderful friends to me. Alan and Kurt have been lending art to the museum for probably three years now and have been assisting us in pushing the way that we address contemporary art for our students, making sure that we're giving our students today's makers, tomorrow's visionaries, by showing emerging talents and blue chip artists that are doing things that are wonderful to show our students in an everyday existence. So, Alan and Kurt, thank you for all that you've done for us as friends and lending this portion of an amazing collection that they have, which has been beautifully curated by our guest curator, Mara Condignato, um, that for everyone to see. So, thank you both. We're also lucky today to have with us our guest curator, Mara Condignato, who's done a spectacular job with this exhibition, and also the, um, the author of our publication, which I'm gonna pick up, which we're very proud of, and we think it's a, a wonderful book that speaks about this collection, this narrative, the collectors, and the collectors as you know, people in a community. So, and that really took place thanks to the amazing contribution by Richard Meyer, who's here with us today, who's gonna to be in conversation with them later. When I spoke with Richard about contributing to the book, he had said to me, I'd been to their house once before, and I was so amazed with all of these different photographs or paintings of, in, of men in their home, I wondered what is it like to live with all these people? So his essay is called The Couple Who Collect Men, which is perfectly appropriate, and really sheds light into the process of how Alan and Kurt have acquired art, how they are part of a, a major art world in Los Angeles scene, but also you know nationally, and how they are really contributing as a voice uh, to many other museums in Los Angeles as their pillars within Hammer, LACMA, and MOCA. So that is wonderful. And then also in the book we don't have with us here today, but she's here in spirit, is Ann Goldstein. Ann Goldstein, we all know, is this amazing curator from MOCA, then the director of the Stiglitz, a super brilliant person married to an equally amazing artist, Christopher Williams, and her little piece on curtain Alan, really kind of give us a window into how they live with their art and the kind of people they are. And it's really wonderful when you can do a show with a book, because a book can't do what the show can do. The book can speak to the narrative of a collection, but it also is allowing us to look at the collectors as collectors, issues in the collecting world, but a wonderful couple. So I think the book encapsulates all of that, which makes us all very happy. So before I kind of introduce this panel discussion, I want to thank our supporters for the exhibition. As you know, all exhibitions happen here at the Mission at our museum are supported by private philanthropy, foundations, and whatnot, and as every museum does, support is needed to put on shows of this quality. So I just want to be able to, and I'm in between lenses, so I really can't see. <laughs> It's a sign of age. I guess I have to get those upgraded. Um, I'd like to thank our supporters for the exhibition. So um, the University of Michigan Health System, the University of Michigan's Office of the Provost, Office of the Vice Provost for Equality, Inclusion, and Academic Affairs, the Department of Art History, the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, the Institute for Humanities, the Residential College, and the Catherine Tuck Enrichment Fund, which Without that support, this exhibition and publication could not have happened, nor my amazing development team. Um, also, this exhibition upstairs has some wonderful works on loan that Alan and Kurt had already gifted to three amazing museums, as I just mentioned, in Los Angeles, and my colleagues there also graciously agreed to lend those works so we can look at this body of thinking from their collecting strategy. So I want to explain how our program will evolve today. Um, after my remarks, our guest curator, Mara Condignato, 
will say a few things about the exhibition or his curatorial vision for that, because the idea behind the show is completely his and the narrative. Then what will happen is Mario will join the seating up here and Richard Meyer and Curtin Allen will also join. And then a discussion will be led by Richard Meyer with the three of them. And after that conversation, then the, it will be open to questions from the, um, from the floor here, which Richard will signify people for those uh, questions to be answered. So after that, we will be having refreshments upstairs where the Frankel entrance to the museum is. So it's the entrance to the new wing, simple way to say it, versus the Beaux-Arts building. And then the gallery will be open until 6, 6.30 tonight. So please, if you haven't seen the show, go back to see it. And then I hope that everyone will join us here at 6 o'clock in the apps. We're going to have this amazing performance, which is one of our collaborations with the School of Music, Theater, and Dance and UMA, uh, entitled Men, 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 co-curated by Nadine Hubs and Peter Sparling. Peter's here with us, an amazing faculty member in the school. And um, we love when he's here, and Nadine is there as well. So um, just briefly, Mario, to who he is. Many people in the art world uh, do know who he is, but some people in Michigan might not. Mario really is this amazing curator and is highly regarded internationally. And this is the first show he's doing in the US. And Mario curating the show for us in many ways, thanks to you, Alan being the amazing lawyer that he is, can find anyone you want to find or the contacts on anybody you want to meet and know. So Alan did that effortlessly within, I think, a day. Um, we were then able to be in touch with Mario, who did recently he did an amazing show in Venice at the Biennale called Fragile, which had moved a lot of people to Venice Biennale's back. And his sensitivity to the subject matter, as Alan said to me, I think he would be the right person. He has this kind of balance. And those that know Alan and Kurt will know they have a sensitivity and a sensibility that is extremely rare uh, within the art world and can operate at many different levels. So his opinions I value highly. Anyway, Mario agreed, and his legacy of exhibition curating has been some of the most important names in the art world from Rachel Whiteread, Thomas Struth, Franz West, uh, Bars Maidrin, to the first show on Damien Hurst, Richard Serra, Jeff Koons, Anish Kapoor, and he really is relatively young in appearance, but when you hear these names, you think he must be in his 70s. He's not. <laughs> yeah. See, Europeans age so gracefully. Um, then next, I just want to say a few things about Richard Meyer, who we're thrilled to have here. Richard is the Robert and Ruth Halpern Professor in our history at Stanford University, where he teaches courses on 20th century American art, gender and sexuality, art censorship, and the history of photography. He's the author most recently of What Was Contemporary Art for MIT Press 19, uh, 2013, then co-authored a book with uh, Catherine Lord called Art and Queer Culture, 2013, and then his first book, which is a landmark publication, and um, uh, those are proud with they still have it, or trying to find a copy of it. His first book entitled Outlaw Representation, Censorship, and Homosexuality in 20th Century American Art. Uh, published in 2002, received the Charles Eldridge Prize for Outstanding Scholarship from the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which speaks volumes to him. Alan and Kurt, I don't think, need an introduction. They are both highly regarded at what they do and um, are pillars in the art community. So we're very thrilled that they're also joining us. And so I hope after this event, you'll join us upstairs for a beverage see more of the exhibition, and then stick around for the performance at 6 o'clock of Men, Men, Men. But at that point, I'd like to have Mario come up and take the podium. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all seen that film, The King's Speech, when, you know, <laughs> I, I, no, I really apologize for my poor command of the English language, so I will try to, to do my best to uh, when one is asked to do an exhibition on, on a private collection, basically has two choices. Uh, one is to pick the works that one thinks are art historically the most relevant, the, the most interesting, the most important, the most original, and show them 
basically individually. So just you know, show the com you know, a combination of, of different words. The, the other alternative is to construct a narrative around these works, so like having you know, a lot of ingredients and try to, to see what kind of, uh, you know, the best possible result with what you have by constructing uh, a meaning in which the public can uh, mirror oneself, can somehow uh, take something from, from this narrative and try to construct a narrative of, of one's own. And uh, Alan and Kurt's collection it's based on, uh, on, 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 as you know, as uh, Joe said, on, uh, on mail and uh, on, on man. A lot of uh, photographs are involving man and issues of gender and masculinity. So I thought to construct a narrative around this focus, around this issue, uh, in which by dividing uh, works by thematically, uh, people can, uh, the public can somehow recognize oneself in, in some of these uh, step and aspects of life which we all encountered. And uh, so I divided it into sections. Uh, one is comrades and rivals, which is the one which uh, is, 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 the, is the first one, uh, with the, also the Jeff Wall uh, boxing, which I think is very uh, significant of, uh, to describe this theme. Uh, it's, I imagine, a very uh, main thing that we all encounter, you know, when, especially when we are getting into adulthood, you know, the comrades, uh, you know, the, 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 the friendship that between uh, men, but also the rivalry. And the, these are themes that are as old as as humanity, and then uh, youth and initiation. We all had that uh, very uh, challenging period in life uh, called adolescence in which you know, we started to ask ourselves a lot of questions about who we are and, uh, and, um, and we are initiated in some of the most important aspects of life. And then, uh, you know, the other theme was physicality and drive. Uh, the men tend to express themselves also through physicality. There is a, there is a, there is a, uh, and you know, sports, for example, is one of the uh, of the main example for this. Uh, it somehow translates uh, some people uh, in ancient time. People went to war all the time and sport somehow substituted that kind of urge for, you know, that aggressiveness is somehow channeled for that. Then seeking that identity. I mean, we all try to, it's, it's a challenge that we have in all our life. And then self-harm and rest. Uh, also, you know, the relation we with our own self, you know, the physicality inwards. Human comedy, uh, you know, the, the, the role of the jester who can say or do what he wants and be forgiven like a child has been a recurrent theme in the arts, you know, like in Shakespeare, King Lear. And uh, then, of course, with the, mafia, the great Matthew Barney, uh, uh, cycle, the Cream Master cycle that Alan and Kurt uh, uh, owns. Of course, the theme of stimulation was an obvious uh, choice. And uh, then it was the camera vision. Uh, now through, you know, through photography, uh, through internet, um, wireism, pornography, and related, related subjects you know, we, through the internet, got a complete new meaning. And the work of Thomas Roof, for example, which takes these pictures from pornographic uh, websites, show how today we perceive nudity through the pixelated image. 
before it was through photography, it was through, earlier it was through paintings or, or through engravings. And now, you know, the vast majority of people take it from, you know, the, the, the new media. And so somehow, you know, nudity and pixelation are quite close. Um, then there is a section calling Finding the Words, in which uh, uh, the, the great work by Paul Graham, which is uh, graffiti on possibly what was a urinal, I imagine, um, and which is another way uh, art in the 20th century can translate meaning, not only through images, but also through words, and, and so on. I really try to, uh, to, to make some sense of all these works by, by, by addressing issues to, that everybody you know, can interpret and, and make their own. I also would like to take the opportunity to thank so much Alan and Kurt for giving me this great opportunity of curating this exhibition. And uh, really, really, uh, it was such a pleasure to, to work with you, and it was very much a teamwork. I want to thank Joe Rosa. I mean, he's a you know, wonderful colleague, and uh, he was so encouraging from the beginning. And the whole team of the museum. I mean, it has been extraordinary to, to work with you, really. It was so, so great, and you know, to work from the other side of the ocean on an exhibition like this is not easy. And they were really, really wonderful and make me feel here all the time. Thank you so much. And now we get to the. Um, so I'm Richard, um, that's Kurt, and that's Alan, um, and that's Mario, as you know. Uh, so I just, I thought I would start, although Mario raised a lot of questions that are issues that I want to return to, I had a, my own question in mind, which is slightly different, which has to do with being a couple who collects. And I think that, um, I mean, there are, of course, lots of couples um, in the art world who who collect work, but I'm interested in kind of the backstory um, that people who come to this exhibition could not see from the works or even from the curatorial um, logic that, that Mario has, has organized in the, in the museum for us to um, experience the works. And when I think of couples, I think not only of connection and commitment between two people, but also conflict and um, difference. <laughs> so I mean, and I'm speaking partially autobiographically here as someone in a couple. <laughs> but, um, but I think it's true like, that, that like, we, do, you know, we don't often enough talk about how, one, how couples, I mean, maybe in therapy, you talk about overcoming differences. But I think in the art world, we, you know, I, so I want to know, I'm not going to ask you to talk about you know, um, personal differences, but in a way, I'm interested in you, there must have been some disagreement at some point about something to acquire or not to acquire, or even just disagreement about liking something, one of you liking it or more than another. So I'm interested in, okay, if when there is an aesthetic or interpretive or financial disagreement, like how do you, how did you negotiate that as a couple? Want to start? No. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's so you're already negotiating it. <laughs> We've spoken the past couple of days to uh, various uh, groups at the museum, student groups, and uh, we've spoken as docents uh, to uh, here. Alan, I'm not sure it's on. Oh, it's on. How about now? Yes. To various uh, student groups, and we've acted as docents for a couple of tours through the museum, and, and the subject has come up. Huh. And uh, the two. The two works in the show that Kurt has highlighted, because other people have asked question, a similar question, uh, as to something that he didn't really spark to as much as I did, uh, in terms of buying them, keeping them, donating them, were the Paul McCarthy photograph and the Baldessari photograph that is in the show. So I, why don't we just let Kurt hold forth on what he doesn't like? About <laughs> <laughs> Great. 
Um, okay. Well, to the question more generally, um, we have been pretty much in sync the entire time. We've been collecting together for, we've been together 27 years, and we've been collecting um, that whole time. And a couple things are kind of interesting to me about that is that we seldom disagree. And in fact, there's a, it's remarkable the degree to which we do agree, which is early on, we sort of realized we'd walk into a gallery and sort of not, we weren't trying to do a parlor trick or anything. We were just we'd walk around the gallery, we'd come out the other side and what did you like, what didn't you like? And invariably we were like completely on the same page and it was sort of spooky the way that we did that. And we came at the collection and came at art in, from very different directions, which maybe there'll be additional questions about that, but, um, so we've been remarkably in sync. Um, and we decided early on that we wouldn't acquire anything that both of us didn't, you know, didn't agree on. And so there are some things that we probably let slip through our fingers, which will be, go unnamed here, uh, that we didn't agree on and so we didn't get them and probably missed some opportunities. Um, there are a couple of other things in the collection that we waited, like, you know, there's one in particular where I just didn't get it and, you know, we just didn't get it for a long time and then finally I came around to it and we bought, the piece, bought a piece. Um, so back to Alan's, you know, putting me on the spot with what I don't like and why. I don't know if everybody saw the show, the Paul McCarthy um, sort of self-mutilation um, piece. Uh, I just, I don't respond to it. I mean, I like Paul McCarthy. I like a lot of his work. I did not want to live with that one. And I will, I, you know, there's a lot of like extreme stuff that I, you know, would be happy to live with. That's not one of them. And yet, um, in a, f you know, fit of peak obstinacy, We've kept that one, and um, Alan had it in his bathroom where that was totally fine. The Baldessari, um, I don't know, I just, I, I never really sparked to it and was perfectly happy for it to, um, to go into storage, and I'm happy to see it again, but I don't know, I don't know what more to say than it, than it just, and I like Baldessari a lot, so I don't know if that comes even close with a lot of words to answering the question. No, but I, I think, like, actually knowing that the, it's the McCarthy that was in your bathroom, which is sort of, I haven't been in your bathroom, but I'm, I'm assuming that you are the only one who goes in your it's bathroom. It's not there, now it's here. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think that's an interesting placement, first of all, in the bathroom and in your bathroom, because you know, one of the things I'm very interested, I was in the interview, I kind of pressed on was the difference between living with works of art as a collector, and then, which unless you're a friend or an acquaintance, of you guys, you know, people wouldn't, or there's an article in a magazine where it was sort of produced, people wouldn't have access to, the, to, the, to seeing the work as it's lived with on an everyday basis, as opposed to seeing it in this very beautiful installation, but it, which is a thematic installation done by a curator, not by, not by I mean, I know you, there was consultation and teamwork, but nevertheless, a, a kind of idea curatorially conceived, not, as a, co a collect collectors. So I wondered just if you could speak a little bit about the question of placement. So that work, which wasn't so much one of the few, I guess, where you weren't totally in sync, went into a space that, in the house that was kind of designated as more your space, right? And I assume certain things go in your office or in I'm Kurt's sure you didn't go into every nook and cranny in our house, including the bathrooms when you were- I went in the bathrooms, but I, maybe you didn't tell me it was your bathroom. Oh, well. I don't, I didn't know whose bathroom was, I didn't realize there were designated bathrooms for each of you. Mario's or others. Been in, you've been in our bathrooms, Mario's been in our bathrooms. Okay, I'm sorry. Joe's been in our bathrooms, any number of people here. Or right here, bathroom. to the bathroom. <laughs> maybe, maybe not at the same time, but. We, it's, the whole house is a Kunsthalle and some, uh, it's inevitable that some walls end up feeling more privileged than other walls. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, that uh, you're right, Kurt, that uh, it's not an accident that that piece ended up in the bathroom. Part of it is just because of scale. Part of it is because it's a tricky thing to install. Part of it is because uh, there are certain works in the collection that if you put them up in a very visible, uh, prominent place, it's all anybody talks about. Huh. And nobody sees anything else and everything else becomes invisible. We had that experience most uh, dramatically 
we own a lot of Wolfgang Tillmann's work, and only one of them is in the show. And one of the works we own by Wolfgang Tillmann's is a, uh, a fairly well-known work of his called A.A. A. Breakfast. And there's a child in the audience. Oh, yeah. And it's a, it's a, yes, there's a child in the audience. Uh, and it's a rather risque work. Uh, and uh, when we, I don't think we ever put that work up in our current house. We, we, we moved into our current house 16 years ago. And we haven't had that house, that, that work installed for 16 years. And we, it was the one work we asked Mario not to put in this show. And the reason why is that when we put that work up in our other house, no one saw anything else, literally. Uh, and we, people would go, leave parties at our house and we get phone calls, oh, what about that? And that's all anybody would talk about. And I went, life is too short. That's, uh, and I, I think it's a really important, significant, valid work. It fits really well into the collection, into, into uh, the body of Wolfgang's work. But there, there are issues to be faced with that sort of thing. Well, I think that's also interesting, and this is kind of a question for Mario and Kurt Nallen, um, in terms of this move from what, from a private home to, to a public museum. Um, and you're, I think, Alan, even talking about within the private home, it's not always so obvious what's going to work, or um, in in terms of other people coming into that home, friends and family and so forth, much less children. You know, sometimes with kids or I don't know other other people who might not either might over -resp might respond too well, <laughs> like to be too excited by something, or not enough. But um, my question is sort of about seeing it as Mario has organized it here, for example. And one of the things for me, that because um, by the time that I did the interview with Kurt and Allen, the work was already, well, most of the work that's here was not on display in your house. And so I actually didn't have a good sense of the scale and the varieties of scale, not just the, the scale of the work, but also the scale of the different scales of the figures within. So for example, I mean, although I knew the Kathiopi surfers were really small, it's different seeing the, how large the print is and then seeing how small the surfers are in relation to the ocean and the, and the, and the print. And also I really like, sorry, I'm gonna get to the question now, which is, um, I guess I didn't understand when I looked at the Matthew Barneys, also those, those self-lubricating frames. The works, when they're seen upstairs, or is it upstairs? Or, yes. Okay. Um, they actually felt, maybe not sculptural exactly, but they felt very physically embodied as, as objects to me. And I think that um, even walking in and seeing these two works that were about text and desire and secrecy, um, the Larry Johnson and the Paul Graham, it really just changed my whole sense of what this show and ideas about masculinity could be in terms of not just images of like hunks or, you know, homoerotic display. So I guess I, I wanted to hear a little bit both from you guys about how it feels to experience this on these white walls, not in your home, and through the curatorial lens that Mario has imposed. And Mario, how you, as it were, came up with, I mean, you've told us what that, but how you came up with that device. Because I also feel like it presents an oblique. Your categories are not the ones that I or probably anyone else would have invented to explain or, or organize this collection. So it's kind of a question in both ways, that way and this way. I have a, I have a lot to say about that. Do you mind if I no, blather no, on please, about that? Do. Because I, I think that speaks to what Joe was saying earlier about how we ended up having Mario curate this show, and I'd like to elaborate on that because it is central to your, uh, the answer to your question. We were uh, at the Venice Biennale with some of our friends from Dallas who are here today, and uh, one of our mutual friends uh, told us to go and see Mario's show, Fragile, at the Chini Foundation in Venice. And we all trekked off and saw the show. And the show was a show that was, the, 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 the element that tied it together was it was all work uh, by various distinguished contemporary artists, which dealt in some way or another with the medium of glass. In all sorts of ways, there was glass. In some of the pieces, there was a famous Pipaloti Rist piece in the, uh, in the show, The Capper, where she, uh, 
walks down a street to some rather cheerful mu music and smashes in the windows of cars uh, and everything in between. Um, sort of a compendium of 20th century art uh, uh, having, to deal, having to do with uh, glass as subject, object, whatever. And when we saw that show, uh, uh, having discussed with, with Joe the notion of putting on a show just of photography in 5,000 square feet about uh, um, men and male identity, uh, it completely jumped out at Kurt. We had been talking about any number of curators, but we, we, we have our own certain sense of our own aesthetic and how we approach collecting art and installing art and exhibiting art and presenting it to ourselves and to others in our, in our home. And even when we lend it out, we have some sort of feeling about good homes to which to lend it or to give it. And we saw that show and immediately said, this guy gets, he gets it, he gets our aesthetic, he gets what we're trying to do. He's taken a theme which could have just laid there like a lox and died and been trite and silly and uh, forced and turned it into something that was incredibly, not just aestheticized, but truly a, 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 a remarkable aesthetic experience and, uh, and, and tied what seemed to be disparate works together in a really elegant way. Uh, and that's what we hope to do in our collection, I, let me be so bold as to say. And so when we saw that, we saw this guy's name, Mario Codognato, on it, and I saw that he had done some show in Venice, and, and his, we looked at his CV materials that, that were in, uh, accompanied the show, and, did some short some in some museum in Naples. He'd done something for Larry Gagosian, and he'd done something for Sadie with, and and he lived in London. So uh, we called a friend who was a dealer in London, Sadie Coles, and said, "Do you know this guy?" And she said, "Absolutely. He worked with me at Anthony Dorfay Gallery. He's the greatest. You have to do this. You have to do this. This is a brilliant idea. I know you. I know him. Just do it." And uh, uh, and so I was. I was floating around on various uh, water taxis in Vaporetti with some of these people up here in Kurt and on the phone and on the email and whatever saying, you don't know me, but <laughs> to a total stranger whose family jewelry store, I had, it turned out I had walked by 7,000 times in Venice. <laughs> Uh, and, and he said, well, uh, sounds interesting. Why don't you send me the materials? And um, so we did, and, and we just struck up an immediate friendship and camaraderie, and it, it just, it, it was a very natural thing. And, and I, I think that goes somewhat to answering your question. So I'm gonna ask one last question and then open it up to the audience, which has to do with um, actually the role of women, particularly, women, I mean, women, female photographers, but also a little bit of, of female masculinity and transgender content in both drag and, um, uh, drag both ways. Um, uh, and because this is, not a, this is not a collection of, even though it's about masculinity, it's not a collection by any means exclusively by men or of biologically, um, um, design, uh, biological men. Um, so I guess I wanted to, I, I, and it seems to me that actually masculinity becomes this lens through which to look at a lot of issues, fantasy, labor, adolescence, but also in a way, um, I think gender broadly conceived to include women. And I just wondered if you, I mean, relations between men and women, but also between the woman behind the camera, perhaps, and the, man, and the men in front of it. So I wondered if you could say something about the importance of women artists and photographers to your collection or to your curatorial vision. I can talk about it, but no, please, please. Oh, after you. <laughs> well, what's interesting, and I haven't really thought about it until the, just this very moment, is that um, one of the things that uh, was true about me is that 
Uh, I love women, and I um, most of my best friends are women. And early in our relationship, it drove Alan crazy that the only thing I brought to the party socially was women. <laughs> and there was a... I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, this isn't a therapy session, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, as a gay man, you know, it took me a long time to come out because men weren't nice to me. Men, you know, I didn't like men, and men didn't seem to like me, and so why would, how could I be gay? And so I gravitated toward women who were nice to me and had some girlfriends whose lives I screwed up for a while temporarily because of my confusion about that. So... I haven't really thought about this in a long time in terms of having this collection that, well, finally I came around to liking men, but, um, but I haven't really thought about the relationship between that being my sort of naturally gravitate toward women and having this collection that is all about men and masculinity. So I need to pause there for just a second and sort of ponder that for a moment, but... Um, and I kind of forget your question, but I do think that what, part of the trans thing that's interesting to me is that, um, you know, we, we got the uh, Nan Golden photograph, uh, Joy at the Love Ball, whatever year it was, a long time ago. And it was before I had any relationship at all with the trans community. And now I work at the Los Angeles LGBT Center and I work with um, young people, uh, homeless youth primarily, and a large and growing um, uh, percentage of the population of people who come to our drop-in center and the people who live with us um, are transgender and both in both directions and somewhere in between and sometimes they go back and forth. And so I've had to sort of become conversant in a way that um, when we first started collecting that work and Kathy Opie's you know, uh, work also, preceded that um, my, my, current, my current daily experience. Um, and uh, I'll stop there, I guess. Mario? <laughs> I think it's an interesting, one of the interesting things about the collection, therefore about the exhibition, is that despite obviously focuses on certain issues, but they, you know, the, the, the works are by heterosexual men who photograph, you know, heteros so non-specifically uh, uh, gender issues um, subjects, and vice versa, you know, they are, or they could be taken by women of transgenders and, and so on. So it's, it's and that, that's, I think, what makes it interesting, that given all of this, you, you can also construct, a, you know, you can make an exhibition which that becomes inverted comma irrelevant, in a way. To, 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 to the you know to the to the whole assembling of the exhibition. So maybe can I, can I just yeah. say um, uh, I'd like to just acknowledge the fact that uh, the one artist in our collection who actually is here today is Sharon Lockhart, uh, and uh, who, whose work is uh, a key part of our exhibition and uh, an, uh, an important part of our collection. And so how I I really haven't. Sharon's been to our house, she's seen our collection. I haven't really ever talked to her in great detail about how she sees it. I, you know, she can speak for herself, she's here. But um, I, 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 there is, for me, a real identification uh, in that work with, you know, an observation of men, of men in the workplace, uh, of men relating to each other, and uh, it's obviously from the female gaze, there's an enormous amount of critical theory written about uh, the male gaze. She's a woman gazing at men, and she sees what she sees. You can, uh, you can bring to her work, like every other artist in the show, your own narrative of what you, what you see in looking at, at their photographs. Uh, but uh, Joe and I, and, uh, and when we brought on Mar Mario, we, we, uh, Kurt and I, and we all of us had a number of conversations about inclusiveness of women, of transgender, of, uh, of all sorts of issues of inclusiveness. And one of the things that we, that we focused on was uh, 
I had no idea was who Mario was when I saw his show. I just went, that's it, that's the guy. Turned out he's a straight guy married with two uh, children who was living in London then and lives in Vienna now. And when the kids and wife have moved off to, to uh, Rome and, has, and he has a commuter relationship. So he has his own interesting uh, uh, cavalcade constellation of stuff going on around him. Richard's gay uh, as... Um, <laughs> As, as Joe was saying, Anne Goldstein also wrote for the catalog. She's a straight woman uh, who is a very old friend of ours. So the relation, and uh, as Richard said, he's uh, sort of a relative passing acquaintance of ours, and, and Anne is a very old friend of ours. So the, the nature of the relationships of the people putting this show together are, uh, are intentionally variant, and it's part of what gave uh, all of us, I think, a sense of community and frisson and, uh, and stimulation in doing it. So I'm going to open it up to the audience now, but I, I just wanted to say that I think this show helps us to remember that unlike people, works of art do not have genders or sexual orientations, nor would I say do exhibitions, although they activate different desires um, and different ideas about gender and sexuality in different viewers. And I think that that's relevant in the sense of your response to fragile, I mean, you saw a shared sensibility that wasn't about an alignment of who, who of, of sexual object choice by the curator and the collector. And I, I just think that sometimes we get too narrowly focused on imagining some sort of mirror between artworks and people, when in fact one of the reasons that, that art exists is to not be a reflection, but an alternative to how life is organized. So maybe with that um, said, we could open it up to questions. And I know there must be questions. No one likes to go first, but someone has to go first. Oh, are we done? Oh, oh. No, we're going to do mics to the. Questions in the audience can be heard. Sorry. So there's a hand, thank you, in the, toward the back. Thank you. Yeah. Um, some of the most striking pieces upstairs are in groups or sets, the, the set of the, the male prostitutes or the two Maplethorpe. How often do you purchase works as sets or groupings? And do they then go up onto your wall as sets? Do you, do you divide them up? Have artists ever asked that they always be in sets? Um, yeah. The Maplethorpe is a diptych that was, that's inseparable. Uh, and it's one of, if not the only diptych he ever made. It was in the last show he did before he died. Uh, the Philip Lorca de Corsia's, the photographs we were talking about first, are all individual works. And people own, some people own one, some people may own more than one. It was very important to us to have that group of works. And we bought them as a group, and we've exhibited them in the house as a group. Uh, I think on some occasions we've exhibited less than, fewer than all of them, but the most effective installation of them has been all of them together. Uh, as you can see here, they're particularly strong together. Hi, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody that made this, um, this show and all the events around it possible. It's been really wonderful. It's, it's great to have the exhibit, to have the catalog, to have all the you know, programming around it. So I know that was a, um, a huge effort and um, it's really enriching for those of us who live here and those of us who teach here. So thank you all for that. Um, and I, you know, I first, um, knew Curtin Allen through activism more than um, on a lot of different levels. And I wondered, um, what is your relationship now to activism and maybe to the art collection? Is, is, is it a form of activism? What's this? Is there a relationship or are there, there doesn't have to be. Um, but like, wh how do you conceive it and how does it tie in or not tie in with your, you know, various other commitments? I, I, 
I feel like for me this is a realization that sort of has come on gradually, but I feel like it's of a piece. I mean, I do feel like what we're doing is activism. Um, I think we're both known as activists in the LGBT community, uh, me professionally. Um, and when I met you, I was on the board of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and I know somebody else here, um, I forget your name, who did the dance thing tonight, but you know, I was involved when the, uh, f Peter, right, um, uh, organizing campus groups um, ar around the country, LGBT campus groups in the 90s. Um, and I haven't really thought about the art collection and the collecting that we do, but we, you know, we were an out gay couple in Hollywood. Uh, before there were a lot of out gay people in Hollywood, and Alan was out as a gay person before I knew him, which was very rare in those days. And so I do kind of feel like it's all of a piece, and I do feel like there is a connection between what I do professionally and what we've done in activism and the collection. Uh, and I, I don't know, it feels like it's blended and sort of seamless. I don't know how you'd answer that. Answer, he would answer that the same. <laughs> yes. Nikki, my new best friend, Nikki. Hey, uh, yeah. Um, so yesterday in our talk, you guys had said that you were collecting works that were not photographs, and this also question is also a question for Mario too. But all the photographs upstairs are photographs, and I was wondering your thoughts about your thoughts on like how photo photography as a medium is like the best for showing identity, if it's not the best. But. No, I mean, it was a, a choice, it was made in a way, uh, was presented to me. They wanted to show the photography, you know, the, the photography part of their collection. And uh, is, to answer the question, it probably has been easier for me, has been an easier job to just do an exhibition of just photo photography than, you know, uh, having also drawings or paintings. Um, I think if that was the case, I would have probably have to have thought a completely different um, concept for the show. I, f I think, you know, the fact that it was just photography help in, in, in doing what we, what we tried to do. For me, it was an aesthetic proposal. Uh, at really not about hierarchy of media. It was completely about the aesthetics of it. And it was uh, stemmed from our very real experience of trying to exhibit photography and drawing and sculpture uh, and painting in the same rooms at the same time. That is a very tricky thing to pull off. And it is rare that it is pulled off well. And it's rare that we can pull it off well. And we've tried many times. And uh, I think we've done a pretty good job of it sometimes. Uh, and and I, I feel like we've honored the intention and the spirit and the, and the uh, value of the works when, when we've done it as much as we can. But I viewed this conversation that we had with Joe initially about 5,000 square feet, what do you want to do? I went, oh, this is perfect. Let's just do photography because then we won't have any of those aesthetic issues to deal with and all of the themes that are in our collection are well demonstrated in our photography collection. So there's practically no way we can go wrong. That's what really what my thought was behind it. I just wanted to add that I think by having the show just to be photography, you see, I mean, one question that comes up, for me anyway, is, well, what is a photograph within contemporary art practice? Because I didn't understand the Larry Johnson, for example, as a photograph, and so I actually asked people to explain to me <laughs> um, uh, what the process was by which that was made, which in fact it is made photographically, and also the Matthew Barneys, because the frames, uh, which I've never understood what he means by self-lubricating, but I like that word. Um, <laughs> I think I want to be self-lubricating, but um, <laughs> I just lost my train. Oh, so I thought like, oh, actually photography can be sculptural, photography can be painter. I mean that by just limiting it, I think sometimes constraints can be very productive creatively or curatorially. And the, yeah, so that it seemed to me that this was not, well, one photograph framed, you know, one square or rectangular print after another. There was a huge range in terms of scale and presence and 
I think, a questioning of the, you know, the limits of the medium as well. Uh, just on a purely formal level, beyond the content of the... Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that attracted us immediately to Mario. If he could pull off, I mean, if, I don't know if, there, if, if it's available online or anywhere, uh, the works that are, were in his Fragile show, but we thought if he could pull this off with this uh, disparate group of works in various media from various time periods, he can certainly do this. But I, I think, you know, the fact that we're all photographs, it gave us a visual continuity uh, to, to, to the exhibition. You know, wherever you turn your head, you see something. That's the way also it has been displayed. And the fact that, you know, the, basically in this case, the media gives the, you know, the, the coherence, if you like, of, uh, of, of the narrative. It certainly helps. I mean, I have to admit, uh, did that answer the question? I don't know. But, I'd like to follow that question up with a different question about the constraints of your collecting. Um, not only in this collection, but your collecting uh, writ large. Um, I don't know if I missed it somewhere, but I wonder if you could speak about the decision to collect art about men, boys, maleness, and masculinity or when that happened, how it happened, whether there are um, closets full of women, girls, and femininity <laughs> in your home, or maybe yet another bathroom. Um, <laughs> and, and especially, Kurt, you've spoken about the importance of women in your life. So I'm, I'm really curious. I, I would really not want to just take it as a given that a gay male couple would gravitate toward collecting men, boys, males, and masculinity. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that to be presumed at all. Me neither. Right, so it seems to me a glaring, maybe sort of elephant in the room. Um, and I would also like, I would love to hear you talk about the pleasures and perhaps the discomfitures of um, such a disciplined uh, uh, approach to Collecting. Yeah, we've been asked this question a lot. The, la the, first, the first question about, you know, was there a decision or how did we decide to do that? And when I came along, I insisted on it. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, Alan had already started collecting and, uh, and and had a small collection when I came along, and and as uh, and right now there's only one piece that um, predates me in the collection, which is a Robert Longo drawing of two men, sort of in a like an embrace or falling into each other. It's a little bit ambiguous what it is that's going on, but um, but that was really the first, you know, piece of that of that nature um, that was in the collection, and. Um, one of the things that we responded to about it, that we liked about it and talked about it early on was the fact that it was two men. And we started with some sense of deliberation um, collecting around couples. And so, for instance, we bought an Art Schwager early on, an Art Schwager painting that was um, a crosshatch painting. So it was sort of like a you know the duality, pardon me, cross, cross weave. Um, we bought two um, Mike Kelly photographs. Um, one was, you know, they hung, they, uh, there's a picture of them in the catalog actually. And they both um, are installed at the floor and they have uh, boxes in front of them. They're pictures of um, stuffed animals and the boxes in front of them have the stuffed animals in them and there's a little lid you can lift up and see. And one was tall and one was short. We thought, oh, that's cute. That's the tall one's Alan, the short one's me. And, we, and, and so we kind of started, again, like looking for pieces or we gravitated to pieces that were about um, two. And, um, and they weren't necessarily photographs, or they weren't necessarily images of men or figur figurative um, uh, images. And um, 
from my point of view, it sort of came around sort of gradually, and I there was no sort of intentionality on my part. It just sort of it sort of gradually happened that we became we sort of lost the two thing, and it became sort of a, a, a male, you know, identity, gender, and. Uh, I think at that, so for me it wasn't a deliberate thing, it wasn't a decision, it was something that evolved. Alan answers it a little differently and I could let him do that. There was a little more intentionality about it. But, and I, so I'll hand it off to him and he can finish that thought, but then I'll have him answer the second question. Yeah, after you remind me of the second question, because, but I'm really glad we asked the first question because I was, as, as we were, planning to come to Ann Arbor, I was hoping somebody in a big public setting like this would ask me that question, so thank you. Uh, there are not any closet images of women lying around. Uh, and, and any number of our female friends in the art world have joked around with us, and as Freud would have you believe there are no jokes, about women in the collection there are a couple of teeny, tiny images of Lisa Love and Anne Anka in, uh, in um, a uh, Elliot Hundley that we own. Which, by the way, I bought for Alan's birthday um, earlier this year, and I really debated whether to buy one of their, it was a, it was a triptych, three photographs, and there were these little bitty women in them, one of whom is Lisa Love, who we know, and I really debated whether or not I liked that picture better than another one that had no women in it. And I thought, fuck it. I'm just going to buy the one with a woman in it. And, but it was a big decision. Right. But that, that big piece, the reason we have that big piece by Elliot is because it's, in Elliot's view, about his brother, who we know. Um, and that was what drew us to the piece. Um, and there is one other piece that we have that has a woman in it. And it is, uh, we, we gave that piece to Mocha. It's a piece called Putting Up a Fence Corner by um, Bruce Nauman. And in it, Bruce Nauman puts up a fence corner on his ranch in New Mexico. And his wife, Susan Rothenberg, who is a wonderful artist, unintentionally come, uh, 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 without any uh, foreknowledge on Bruce's part, comes home unexpectedly from a trip and wanders into the frame and he's like going, I'm, I'm in the middle of shooting a video, get out of my frame. And so those, I mean, I, 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 I just tell you those stories because there is a really deep intentionality about having the collection be about men and male identity. And even, even with that, which we, which we kind of realized later, uh, that piece of Bruce's, uh, we realize that there is a certain humor about it, and and when I when I was sitting around my house anticipating your question, Nadine, I was thinking, you know, what do I really have to say about that? Because like Kurt, many of our best friends are women. We're really close to women. We love women, and I was thinking, well. How can you answer that other than from the heart and say, if you graduated from the University of Michigan and made a good living and were able to collect anything you wanted, what would you collect? And the answer for me is what we've collected. And I think collections are very autobiographical. I don't think, clearly every collection isn't uh, a, didactic uh, examination of uh, men and male identity, um, or, nor is every collection by straight people an endless parade of women or couples or straight couples or whatever. Uh, I think it's a choice. And, I th and the, the, the collections that interest, for me it's more a, a matter of narrow casting collections. And the collections that interest me the most and that stimulate me the most are collections that have a focus. And so for me, it's not where are the women. The women are all over the collection. Here's one of them, Sharon Lockhart. I mean, without her, the collection is impoverished. Without Kathy Opie, the collection is impoverished. Without Collier Shore, the collection is impoverished. Without Maria Lasnig, the collection is impoverished. 
so women and their views, which in the case of the artists that I just mentioned, it, in terms of what's included in our collection, are they're telling you or showing you their views about men in a particular context. Just like John Baldessari is some 80-year-old straight guy, he's not gay, but he's presenting two images of two dwarfs, the other, you know, and Kurt and I have a lot of experience being the other. We have a lot of, Kurt has a lot of experience servicing the other in his job. And so, irrespective of the fact that he's not drawn to that piece, I'm intensely drawn to that piece. The piece is about, I was a theater major, that's, that piece is about two dwarfs performing uh, like, uh, uh, for Nichols or whatever, and uh, and I represent actors. I was an actor. That piece has enormous emotional resonance for me. So it's so it's not just about uh, men or, or versus women. It's about a certain kind of work where, which we've collected in a very narrow way that has a real emotional resonance for us. What was your second question? I can't remember. I think that what Kurt called my second question was the part where I asked about the pleasures as well as the discomfitures, and I think that Kurt already spoke to that um, a bit, right, in relation to whether to buy this piece or not to buy this piece when uh, some women showed up. That kind of discipline, I'm imagining, um, must that must go into uh, making this kind of collection, the, the, having a focus, right? And, you know, actually, I, I would like to add to that whether if, if this began in late, the late 80s, and Alan, you spoke earlier about how things were different then for, uh, for gay couples and for out gay people, um, if, if it f feels any different now to have that... Uh, focus and that discipline uh, organizing the collection as compared to when you first started collecting in that way? Well, there's certainly, uh, it, it doesn't feel, when, when, we, when we first started to do it, as Kurt, Kurt was kind of alluding to this, I had a sort of secret agenda, even from him to a certain extent, to do this, which I didn't articulate to him or even myself, and I just started doing it. and and things would appear in the collection and then there would be a certain tiny critical mass of stuff and we would get, a cons as, we, as we said in, uh, in our interviews with Richard and Anne in, in the catalog, we would get a considerable amount of pushback from our professionals, from, uh, from museum uh, curators and directors, from other collector friends, from dealers, uh, who were deeply skeptical about what we were doing uh, and that we were ghettoizing our, implying that we were ghettoizing ourselves and, and, and putting together something that was uh, trivial or trivializing the art. And uh, it took a certain amount of fortitude to pursue that and the collection evolved over a Kurt and I have been together for 27 years, and that uh, that um, w developed into a certain amount of first grudging respect, and I think some real respect from people in the art world. But that was a process, and that was uh, a very interesting process, and it parallels the political process that the, the two of us have gone through as activists, as professionals, and that the country has gone through. I just wanted to, um, one of the, uh, Alan touched on this uh, briefly just now, but one of the issues that we discussed in the interview, which was really interesting, and I didn't know this before our interview, was the level uh, that, at least that Kurt and Alan perceived, the level of, let's say, disapproval or skepticism um, from expert, you know, peak curators, people in the museum and art world about this thematic and the specific thematic which of, of, of men and masculinity or male identity, maybe perhaps, or yeah, um, uh, that Kurt and Allen were 
were pursuing. Um, and I just wanted to say I can relate to that in terms of what, what I was doing in the late 80s and early 90s, which was working on first a dissertation and then a book about censorship and homosexuality in 20th century American art, which I would often tell people, oh, I'm working on just censorship in 20th century American art, or I would say I'm working on censorship and sexuality in 20th century American art. And now it feels very distant to me to, that I felt shame around my topic, or, that, or actually more than shame, I felt that people would think it was kind of special interest art history, or that what I was doing was ghettoizing. And I think actually to, to insist, or insist is a strong word, but to persevere in, in collecting, in a sense, one's own or something that relates to one's own desires or one's own fascination as a gay man with masculinity. And maybe sometimes that fascination can be, maybe mostly it's very politically incorrect or politically problematic. But desire and pleasure aren't organized around you know, political correctness, generally. And I think that um, we have to remember that to be sort of, as it were, collecting as an out gay couple and insisting on desire as one important element and masculinity as a thematic, um, I think that that's, that that's a very different thing to be doing in the late 80s and the early 90s and we might want to remember the AIDS epidemic here and all kinds of homophobia that that generated. Um, but than it is than it would be today. And there certainly is no shortage of male collectors who, are, who have focused on images of the female body um, or on, you know, uh, on versions of especially idealized femininity. And so I think that the queerness and the, if, you, if, if we can use that word, but also the audaciousness of the collection is, it, it's for me anyway, as a, as a gay man, it's insistence on, um, as it were, uh, being a male couple who collect men, as I put it somewhat, or you know, somewhat hyperbolically um, entitling the interview. So, um, but I think remembering the shame or the, the experience of shame, or maybe that's strong, but at least of being judged, the disapproval, and also Kurt, you had, and you had mentioned that, or Alan, that in the beginning it was secret, even from Kurt, those terms, secrecy, disapproval, shame, I mean, they're also about coming to terms with one's own sexuality and one's identity as a non-normative subject. And I think that the fact that that in some way is mirrored in the history of the collection is really fascinating. This is a little aside, but you know, something that you just said about your own academic work. Uh, when I was contemplating what to do uh, for my uh, dissertation when I was getting my PhD at UCLA, and this was in the late 80s, I was all but forbidden to do a gay-themed dissertation, which is what I had really wanted to do. And so, anyway, that just sparked that sort of memory and about shame and forbidden, and, and, um, you know, sort of reinforcing this sort of taboo that I already sort of probably had, had internalized, you know, from a very early age. So I find that interesting. So I think we have time for a couple more questions. Yes, the man in the gray sweater. Uh, I'm curious about your impressions having come here. Uh, the question is about the relationship of the collection to this particular site. We're in the Midwest, we're at a university, and we're at Alan's alma mater. How, what meanings uh, generate with the particular setting? We're not in a major urban center at a museum. We're in a university campus at a university museum. Can you say something about, and maybe have there been any surprises for you since you've been here? Wow, North Campus has really been developed. <laughs> it's true, I, I lived in a co-op on North Campus my junior and senior years when it was basically farmland or forest land or whatever it was and that now it's a giant academic uh, wonderland. Uh, so I, for me, it's... Uh, it's more about, I, 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 I've really just been interacting with people at the museum, uh, and the one other time I was here recently, I was interacting with people in the film school, so it actually felt all quite familiar to me in terms of a community of interest. Uh, but the, the, the thing that's so striking is the enormous development of the university uh, in terms of the physical 
attributes of it. It's heartwarming and fantastic. You know, I went to, as I said, I was a theater major, and I went to the uh, to Penny Stamps and went through the uh, theater department and saw what they have, as opposed to the Freeze Building. That's quite something to see. And I went to the art school because uh, the last time I was here in February, because one of my uh, friends' daughters is a student at the art school and went through all of that. That certainly didn't exist. And we went through the music school and. Uh, most of which existed, but it's just thrilling to see all of these young artists. And, ac and actually quite inspiring also to see them coexisting on that North Campus with all the engineers. I, I liked that. I wonder if that question could also just be kind of um, rerouted to Mario. I mean, actually, I've only walked through this museum one time today, but I, I want to go back into it. So we're going to, I mean, the, we're going to stop soon so we have time to go through the museum. But um, it doesn't look, it doesn't seem to me like, a, you know, it seems to me like it could easily be a standalone museum given the space and the collection. But since it is a university museum, did that change or shape your curatorial approach? Well, we certainly discussed it with Joe and his team, and uh, but let's say there was no real form of censorship. If that's the question, I mean, uh, we 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 knew that you know, uh, the kind of um, average public that could uh, visit the exhibition, but we never really took into consideration particular issues. Um, I imagine the vast majority of the public is made by students, and so. Uh, of course, the focus on certain uh, uh, issues that are probably closer to that age, uh, you know, well, taken into consideration, uh, but there was no real particular, let's say, uh, choice or attitude that could have been, you know, strongly determined by the fact that it was a university museum. Uh, then, of course, I trusted Joe that all that we shown was acceptable, uh, yeah, and of course that that's because it's you know, a curator responsibility in a way to, to, to think about the context too. So I just wanted to mention, because the first thing that I saw when I walked into the muse to show was a sign, and I wish I, I had um, memorized it, but I didn't, but it said basically, there are certain, I mean, I'm gonna butcher it, but there are certain works in this show that might not be appropriate for, I don't know, children under the, people, viewers under the age of 18, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And I thought it said something like, Parents may wish to preview the show. Does it say that or am I imagining it? Something like somebody might wish to preview the show? Yeah, Ruth, you're better. To preview the show. Yes. It just and, says parents may wish to preview the show due to adult content. Right, but not uncles or aunts. Like, anyway, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or older brother. But anyway, so. Right, right, okay. So, but my question is, so I said to Kurt, like I read this and, I, and you know, I said like, oh, there's nothing in here. Like, why do they need this, this sign? And then he's like, well, take a look at the Thomas Roof. You know, and I had forgotten, which is the pornographic image, pixelated, but not that pixelated. Not that. Right, so you can, and, and then you pointed out other works as well. The Sam Machino, the nudes, the, the right. athletic. And I, I took no, I, I take no um, offense at that, precaution, and I think it probably would be in a public museum as well, a non-university museum, but it wasn't at your house when I came to your house. Well, I have a story <laughs> about that, which I was, I would, I'd ask Joe or Ruth if there were going to be images uh, put up behind us for this talk, and I had one to contribute, which was, uh, so I was disappointed that there is no one, because the image that I was going to send was one of Thanksgiving about, I don't know, 15 years ago. And that piece was in our guest room. Um, and take a look at it, you'll see what we're talking about. But it was um, above the bed in the guest room. And the guest room was where all of the little kids um, got to go watch TV when, um, <laughs> when they were, you know, when we were finished with dinner. And so I have a photograph of this, you know, big king-size bed with little kids like sitting out, like this, you know, watching the television with this huge pornographic piece behind them. And I thought, we're going to be hauled off to, you know, child services. But um, anyway, so... You're probably much more interested in what was on the TV, they, right? They that, were completely yeah. oblivious to what was up on the wall, thank God. <laughs> so, yes, Ruth? I just want to say, as a humorous note on this, that honestly, those signs are never for the children. <laughs> What do you mean? Oh, they're going to complain. The children are. Right. Of the various types of 
tiny. And in fact, we've had not one, you know, we've, lot, we all, we've done this a handful of times in 15 years. What I liked about the sign was I'd never read it on that said that gave instructions like parents may wish to preview the show. I, maybe that's common now, but. And if you did it, it's really not our problem. <laughs> right. We're yeah. One thing that, just one little story about that having to do with Maplethorpe. Well, two Maplethorpe very quickly. One is when I was interviewing, this is in the interview, which is embarrassing. I said to Kurt and Alan, well, it's weird. Like when I think of, you know, photography and, and male identity and homoerotics, and I think of Maplethorpe, why don't you have any Maplethorpes in your collection? And they were like, well, actually we do. And I just like hadn't seen it, but anyway. Um, but the thing is that Maplethorpe, when he exhibited the, the, the show, The Perfect Moment, before he died, he actually created a slanted table for the display of the XYZ portfolios, the X portfolio being the one that had all the S&M and the explicitly sexual images, so that, and he, he, he devised it at such a height that a small child would not be able to see the images unless he or she was lifted up, presumably by an adult, which I just thought was a really interesting approach by the artist, in this case, to this whole problem. And so, in other words, the parent or the adult had to make the decision, or pro or a ten or twelve year old, I guess, could live. But anyway, <laughs> what does your ten year old work? <laughs> right, right. Uh, but, so maybe we'll have one. I think we have time for one more question. So now, don't embarrass me by not asking the question. There must be yes, or there's two. Okay, so the man in the second, third row. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a question for Mario. There's been a lot of conversation today about um, the construction of a collection through the lens of two gay men. And so you as a straight man um, being asked to put together the show, um, how, did, how did you approach it, um, maybe on just a personal level of how you would look at the lens of the collection, but also um, through, a, through a longer art historical gaze of how you'd position it, um, kind of considering the fact that you're putting together this collection um, by two gay men of the particular subject matter. I promise you it's not a diplomatic answer. I happen to live a, and be brought up and live in you know, big city, et cetera, with a complete open liberal um, you know, attitude and environment, and I never really asked myself, uh, you know, if people are gay or not. And, uh, of course, in this case, because of the subject matter, you know, the focus of the exhibition, that was a sort of, that was the only issue uh, I may have uh, addressed, in the sense how, how to present the show, uh, the show of a collection which is focused on this, but, you know, um, to be honest, it uh, doesn't make, it would not make any difference to, uh, you know, uh, to straight women or whatever. I mean, it's uh, yeah, absolutely, um, that's something that didn't really influence my, uh, any of my decisions or any of my, um, within, within the concept of the, the exhibition. And, and I guess I could reply a bit like uh, Kurt. I mean, I have a lot of, uh, you know, most of my best friends are gay, so, and, and so on. <laughs> So I think the last question will go to the bearded man in the white shirt. Sorry, I don't know people's names. Sorry, this is a little to the side of a lot of the conversation so far, but um, wanted a chance to ask while you're here. One of the things I notice about the exhibition, as Mario's put it together, that I notice about the work on display, one of the things that I'm using as I teach from the show is how well the exhibition captures the range of dialogues that contemporary photography has with cinema and the moving image. It's the kind of second exhibition that Mario has ex organized, or the kind of one of the other subtexts of the show. Um, and since you've mentioned acting, your relationships to the LA community, Hollywood, um, I was curious if that is an active interest for you as collectors, and if it showed that kind of relationship to cinema and the moving image shows up in the work that you collect outside of photography. Yeah, I think it does, and I think that there is a strong narrative element. It's, just not, it's not just images of men. There is a narrative that goes on in nearly every work that we own, and the narrative... Uh, there is a, a, a couple of layers to that narrative. There, there is the whatever narrative may or may not have been in the uh, mind of the artist when he or she created the work, and then there's what... Uh, Mario and Kurt and I and Joe spent a lot of time discussing, which is the open narrative, which uh, by which Mario meant, uh, okay, the artist may or may not have meant this or that or the other thing, and the artist may or may not be giving that up. 
uh, some of the works are actual or doctored film stills from art films that the, that the artists have, have produced, but all of them, I agree, have some cinematic element. Even the portraiture, I feel, has some sort of cinematic element to it. Um, so, yes, that's there, and it is, and, and yes, it's not just limited to the photography, it's in every aspect of the collection, it's in the drawing, it's in the uh, painting, it's in the sculpture, it's all over the place. And I think, you know, one of the things that Mario brought to the party uh, that, was, that made it so engaging for the museum and for Kurt and me to interact with him was the fact that he created these 13 categories uh, as a prism through which to see various photographs in the show, but at the same time invited the viewer to bring his or her own narratives to the work, and I think that's really a major strength of the show and his curatorial vision. So that seems like a good place to, um, to leave off uh, for now. I, um, I think the galleries are open, um, and I'd want to invite everyone to reassemble um, in the apps. No. So um, what we'll do, there'll be whatever beverages upstairs in the vertical gallery, which is main floor. The galleries in the museum will be open till 6. We're usually open till 5. So there's time to go in to see the HE exhibition, meander through the museum. And then in the apps at 6 o'clock is the performance of Men, Men, Men. All right, so thank you, Mario, Richard, Curtin, Allen, for being here and everyone's coming. <laughs>